Good evening. I'm Brian Bowles, Senior Director of Development and Alumni Relations at CTY and host for this evening's Bright Now webinar. It is my absolute pleasure to turn it over to our new Executive Director, Dr. Amy Shelton, who will introduce our special guest. Amy? Thank you, Brian. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, James Ree. James is an acclaimed impact leader, entrepreneur, and educator who transforms people, brands, and organizations by identifying and unleashing purpose through the union of mathematical and creative systems. As an investor, James has helped manage billions of dollars of growth and distressed capital at two Boston-based institutions before ultimately founding Firepine Group a platform that has stewarded the capital of some of the world's most sophisticated investors. His most current venture, Red Helicopter, is driving global system change by uniting people at the intersection of the most tra transcendent values of education principles and money. As an educator, James serves as the Johnson Chair of Entre Entrepreneurship, a professor of entrepreneurship, and senior advisor to the newly endowed Center for Women, Gender, and Global Leadership at Howard University. He is the executive in residence and strategic advisor at the MIT Leadership Center and holds an appointment as senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management. One of James' most notable accomplishments includes using a people over profit philosophy to save Ashley Stewart, a clothing retailer that serves and employs predominantly black women from heading towards liquidation. And this story has been featured by the world's leading media platforms, including most recently by TED Conferences and Brene Brown. James received his BA with honors from Harvard College and his JD with honors from Harvard Law School, where he was an editor of the prestigious Harvard Law Review. Whew. Now, please welcome James Ree and Brian Bowles. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, James, first and foremost, what? thank you. And, and what a mix of experiences. And we're here to talk about math and kindness. If, if I didn't know you, I, I'd say, who is this guy? Um, but thank you so much uh, for making time for us. And um, just as a, as a note, I, James, I wore a sweater just for you. I figured you would come with your sweater. So I, I figured I'd put my sweater on so we'd match a little bit. Um, the next, yes. Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, so first off, you, you are now officially a CTY parent. And I always like to start at home with things, but... Um, I mean, first and foremost, how are you doing? Uh, let me start with that question. Um, I just want to check in and, and see how things are going. Yeah, things are going. Things are going well. You know, family's good. I lost the oldest one to college uh, this past fall. I still have two two daughters left at home. Son went off to Yale and started as a freshman. And um, Meg and I are doing okay. A little sad. <laughs> that the, the the family unit is now broken up, but uh, really really proud too. No, definitely, definitely. Well, as you as you know, I've got a long way to go before I got get there. I've I've got a three year old son, so it'll be a way it'll be a ways away. But I'm enjoying the moments. And Lila so and Lila had a great time this past summer as a CTY um, student. Um, it was an incredible experience for her. Made a life lifetime worth of global friends. Um, three or four different countries. Wow. It was, it was a great experience for her. So, so James, okay. tell me a little bit about the values that your parents instilled in you at a, at a very young age. Yeah, I am the son of two caregivers. So my dad was a pediatrician who immigrated to this country. And when you still could do this, he just hung out a shingle. Um, I don't think he had computers when he first opened his practice. So, and so he took care of children. And my mother uh, was a registered nurse who came here and uh, was a nurse in, in Manhattan. And then when she had three of us, um, took some time off from work and raised us as a, as a mom, stay-at-home mom. And then as soon as... Um, my sister went off to college. My mom, I was very proud of her. She renewed her license here in the US and then served as a nurse in a veteran's home, taking care of Korean War veterans who had helped save her country and her family uh, when she was a little girl in Korea. And so that's wow. how I was raised. Like my parents were very intentional about caring for people 
And they did it in a, as my mom's story just illustrates, in a really purposeful, longitudinally meaningful way. Like she really was thoughtful about why she was doing it too. No, definitely, definitely. And um, I, yeah, well, I don't want to get too far ahead, but um, so I, I definitely want to kind of tap into that red helicopter story, which is yeah. it's so impactful. Um, but good, shifting to kind of school and learning and teaching, uh, kind of what courses interest you the most as a child? Yeah, you know, it's it's. I'm a systems person, so like it's going to be an easy way for me to answer. You're going to say, oh, James, you have to pick one. But I really loved school um, as a kid, all subjects. And when I look back now, and I know that there are a lot of young people listening to this, I, for me, I can – Looking back, I really enjoyed different subjects in that they taught me how people behaved. So the sciences were really interesting to me in terms of bio and chemistry, um, in terms of how we were composed, like who we were. Back then, there wasn't a lot of neuroscience, but I think I would have been really interested in neuroscience if, I, if it had been available to me in the 1970s and early 1980s and neuropsychology. I was really interested in history and literature because history is a retelling of how people behaved. Literature is the way that people interpret the way that they're living their life now. And I connected those two disciplines, history and literature and the social sciences and the, sci and the sciences. I tended to connect those two with um, math. There's a fundamental underpinning of all of them and music. So I was a really avid musician. Uh, I still think a lot that way. So yeah, that's how I, when I look back, that's what really interested me was how each of these subjects explained why people behaved a certain way and how you could affect change and help be helpful to people if you understood the science, the math, and sort of their feelings as represented by um, the way that they were writing and behaving in history and literature. So I have to ask, uh, you, you said you were a musician. Um, yeah. Favorite favorite band, favorite artist, just yeah. curious. Well, I grew up on Long Island, okay? So like uh, I listened to a lot of Billy Joel and then uh, even though Springsteen's New Jersey, New Jersey and Long Island, you know, they're kind of like first cousins. So a lot of that, but it's a lot of very soulful ballad rock. Um, but, you know, I sang a lot. I sang a lot in the jazz uh, ensemble. I played violin, like a lot of uh, chamber orchestra. So even my interests in music were really divergent. Like, um, I love opera. Um, it's a real uh, testament to the human soul when you listen to someone singing opera. So, yeah, music always made sense to me, and it provided me... Um, a real place to sort of connect humanity with math, because we know music is so math-based in a really kind of my own space, right? It was a place of calm for me to start to be able to be creative. Definitely, definitely, absolutely need it. Um, so, so shifting a, a bit to, I guess, back to kind of educational learning, um, just curious, kind of where do you go? Or what? How do you tap into this kind of like a love of lifelong learning and, and what do you turn to for continuous learning? You know, I, um, I'm thrilled to be in the classroom teaching again, because I learn a lot from kids. I always have, like I I'm 51 turning 52. I can't believe I'm this, <laughs> I'm this age. Um, but I really enjoy being with children because the way they view the world is so full of, possibilities and hope, it, their minds are incredibly agile. I mean, we know that from a science perspective that things are not fused up there yet and they're open to real possibilities. I often tease uh, adults that we tend to think in spreadsheets and uh, boxes and rectangles and kids still think in crayons, right? And circles and like helixes and so for me, it's been, um, being a father has been really meaningful for me and for many reasons, but having these three children around, um, it's, it's really kept me young. Um, 
And then for me, like my whole life, I mean, we don't have time to go through my whole life, but generally speaking, I've always wanted to put myself in uncomfortable situations. Hmm. I've never, I'm very comfortable with discomfort. So whether that's writing for a travel book in Austria, in the Alps, hitchhiking around, whether it's walking around Sao Paulo, not speaking Portuguese and sort of like at night, just walking around or doing a summer abroad in Korea and like living with my relatives away from my family or all the careers I've had. It all makes sense to me where I've never been afraid to put myself in a position of being like the lowest on a totem pole. Like I've never wanted to stop. I never wanted to be self-conscious about learning. I think as adults, we sometimes think that we know everything. And I'd much rather be a kid. As a kid, you're not expected to know everything. You go to school and you learn. I think it's just a better way to live life. So I've got to ask, kind of where where did that confidence, courage, kind of, you know, the appetite for risk, where did that come from? And how, how do you generally approach that? I think I have to, like, from a foundational perspective, uh, I really, you know, you know that I've lost both my father and my mother at this point, and I know that there's moms and dads and uncles and aunts and grandparents watching with their children right now. Like, I really owe a lot to my parents. They, um, no parent's perfect. I'm not a perfect parent to my children. But my parents, uh, they, they tried hard and they loved me and it, they did. And um, I had a particularly close relationship with my mother uh, who um, I always knew that she was there for me, both of them, but particularly my mom. And so that is number one, that I could always come home and I would have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and everything would be okay. And um, they love me unconditionally. Um, this, the second thing for me is, you know, it sounds weird, but you know, not to be overly math about this, but sometimes you mentioned risk return, right? I don't, when you try something and you quote fail, so my view has been that if you are learning something, creating new relationships, investing in your brain and making new synapse connections and doing it in a way that is respectful, that leads to long-term friendships, that is reputation enhancing, and that you're doing things that are not harming other people, like, you know, the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. What risk is that then? Hmm. I, I, you know, I've, I've not lived my life trying to maximize every dollar. That's not how I was raised. I mean, again, I came from a caregiving family. I taught high school, as you know, after my first job out of college, I think I made $12,600. <laughs> and I was really excited about it. I've, I've just never valued my, like my time based on maximizing every single dollar at the expense of not learning, not being happy, not being around great people and enjoying their company. I just have not lived my life like that. Yeah. So that's that's where it's from. I don't view I don't view that as highly risky. I think it's really risky to not be with people that you admire and, and are respectful of you and you of them. I think that's riskier to be around people that you're uncomfortable with and who uh, don't have your best interest at heart. Yeah, no, definitely. It actually makes me think about the I guess there's a saying or a quote of you, you think more about the the you're looking back at it, you think more about the, the things you didn't do or the risks you didn't take versus the things that you did did take um, as far as regrets go, if, if that um, if that exists or if, that, if that's a part of thought. Um, very interesting. So, so I want to go to kind of red helicopter and maybe answer this in a red helicopter way, but I mean, we're talking about how do young people can prepare themselves to be future leaders or to be leaders now. Yes. 
Um, can you can you touch on that a little bit? Um, just the preparation for leadership and how it connects uh, to the red helicopter story. Sure. Maybe I'll start with the red helicopter story and then um, answer the second question as part of that. So for those of you who uh, didn't watch the TED talk is, um, yeah, when I was five years old, I, uh, there, was not a, a, there was not an abundance of material wealth in the Reed household when I was five years old. My parents were recent immigrants and and um, I came home from school with a toy red helicopter and I didn't know why I got it, but long story short, I had received it from a family because um, I had been sharing my lunch with my friend at school because he often came to school without lunch. And I didn't know why he didn't have lunch. And, um, but it turns out that uh, his mother had passed away that summer. And so that his father had four kids under the age of like 12. And I'm sure he was beside himself. I can only imagine now being a father and um, losing my wife. And, and so I gave half my lunch and my mom would always meticulously pack my lunch, <laughs> it was like a little perfect lunch box. And in the end of the day, I didn't know why I got the helicopter. My parents had to kind of explain it to me. And in fact, I thought maybe I had done something wrong because Maybe I wasn't supposed to share my lunch because we didn't have a lot of food or a lot of money. It was, and it shows you that as a kid, I think that this innate wisdom of children, which is really the innate beauty of the human species, um, you kind of grow up as a kid with a lot of abundance mindset. There's a lot, right? Even when you don't have a lot, you there's a lot. Children are just so, generous and that they um, they don't understand the meaning of material things. They don't count like that. They think the whole world is, they're exploring everything. I don't know anything. Well, you're not supposed to. It's that mindset that goes away, actually, if you're not careful, right? As an adult, right? Like you start getting programmed and saying, this is how you live your life. You need to know exactly these things and memorize it versus applying it. This is what success looks like. Yeah. Not yours version. Like this is what you need to do. You start getting a lot of that. And so to loop back to your question on leadership, I think that children, when they ask me, how do I be a leader? I say to them, you already are. Just don't forget. Do you promise me that you won't forget? Because you have all these abundance theory. It's this with people, with ideas, the ability to realize that a real leader asks a lot of questions and learns from the people that she or he is supposed to be leading. You realize that as a, a real leader is given permission to help assemble ideas right, is to bring out the best in other people. A real leader does very little talking. <laughs> yeah, a lot of doing quietly and a lot of celebration of other people being incredibly successful, right? That's what a leader does. And children know that intuitively. And that's why I always think about that red helicopter story where um, there were many reasons why for me to not give half my lunch, but I did it without even thinking. It's like, of course, like, sure, I should share my lunch. There's enough. And there were periods in my life where it was easy to forget that. There are periods in my life where it was not as advantageous to be generous because certain work cultures, they pit you against other people. And, um, I just never really wanted to live my life like that. I, and I found that in my career that being that red helicopter mindset has resulted in a lot more quote success um, mm. because you're sharing ideas and you're thinking about big things that and showing people things that are possible versus hoarding and versus memorizing and doing the same thing that everyone else had done. So like it's, that mindset has really kind of served me well. So with thinking about success, I mean, it, there's all obviously challenges and adversity 
that comes along with that. And um, I guess the question is around generally adversity and how you handle that, but kind of more specifically, what, what failures or kind of challenges or setbacks have been the most instrumental to your growth? Um, you know, I tend to view every day, it's like little successes, little failures all of the time. Like, I think that's one thing that I really try to, um, I know there are a lot of young people listening. It's just, it's called level loading your life a little bit that you're not looking for these huge, huge wins, huge losses that you're consistent and that it's continuous learning. It's not no learning and then learn and then no learning. So I'll, one thing I'll say is that I fail, mess up like all the time all the time. And for those of you who are in like the sciences, right? The, the nature of a scientist is that you have a hypothesis and you been, generally try to prove yourself wrong, right? You're supposed to be wrong, like yeah. a lot, right? And if you're into music, creatives and art, you, you draw tons of things, compose tons of things that are wrong. So um, that's my first statement. So for the younger folks, the second thing, look, I think my biggest failure was, um, you know, this company that um, we talked about earlier, this Ashley Stewart, it was a bad investment as a private equity person in a former employer's portfolio. And it, it was a failure. And I think it's an important lesson for everyone on this call that I felt accountable for that failure. And it wasn't necessarily just to the in former employer, it was to the women that the company employed and served that I felt that I could have done a better job as an investor. And so I said, I'm accountable. And I think that's something that unfortunately, in our society today, I know a lot of children talk to me about this a lot that they're like, no one's accountable for anything anymore. Hmm. Right? You can just do bad things and you get and Certainly, there's a lot of that going on, and it's your right to be um, confused about it. Um, it's not a good thing. And so, yeah, I, that was my a failure, and then it ended up turning into um, one of my, quote, bigger successes, right? That from that failure, it became something that Ted wanted to talk about, Business Week wanted to talk about, and I'm more proud of the uh, way that we had the success, not actually the end outcome. Oh, definitely. So, so James, going through a time like that, um, just curious, kind of, who who are some of your mentors, or who were your mentors uh, growing up, and and just kind of, I, I I believe so much in the power of kind of mentorship and community and family. Uh, but kind of what's your approach on that and what's your, what are your thoughts generally on the, the importance of kind of mentorship um, and who are your mentors? You know, I, clearly my, pa my parents were very important influences in my life. Um, growing up, my older brother was a very important person in my life. Uh, my younger sister has become, I love it, like uh, a source of a lot of wisdom for me, as much as it pains me to say that my younger sister, uh, but she is. And so I've been very close to my family and I, I, my wife and I are incredibly close. Um, I've had a few professional mentors, but really the people who inspired me were people I didn't work with. Mm. So I think that's an important lesson that, um, it's like, look, Brian, you, you and I don't work together. We're friends. And it's nice to have that sort of relationship with someone that's of like mind, that has enough space away from your life that can give you sort of informed but distant advice. Yeah. And they're not too much in your kitchen, right? It's sort of like they, they can be more detached. Um, I think detachment is kind of important. Um, so there have been a lot of entrepreneurs that I really they've either founded a big distress fund or founded a tech company 
that they understand what it feels like to have an idea to kind of be laughed at by most of the world who says, that's crazy, you can't do that. They understand what that feels like to be alone. Yeah. And to, it gives you conviction. They give you really, you can you, like pursue James, like rel- keep going. Yeah. Because it's so easy to not, right? It's It really is easy to just, it's too hard. I can't do it. Um, and I still have those feelings, you know, I'm 50 something years old and it's very human. And so what I've really appreciated in my life, I have a lot of friends that look different. <laughs> They're all ages. I've got friends stashed all over the world and um, they've really been sustaining for me. Like it's 50 plus years of friends I've made and I keep them. I never let go of friends. I always keep in touch and it's been a real blessing. James, on, on the on the parent end, uh, which, who would you credit the most, your, your mother or father uh, on the relationship, relationship building and the relation, relational aspect um, that lo- allows you to keep those connections or a little bit of both? Okay. For me, like uh, my mom, <laughs> my mom, you know, my mom, um, and I want to say this to uh, the kids listening, my mom, it, it wasn't as easy for her in this country as it would have been if she had grown up and stayed in Korea. You know, she was an early immigrant to this country. It was pretty isolating for her at times. If you think about when she came here in 1967. And um, there were times that she felt pretty lonely and um, pretty low on the totem pole in this country. But my mother, um, as I think people, anyone who hears me talk about this, you know, I talk about and teach leadership to like some of the most elite (laughs) companies and CEOs in the world. I always say, you're kind of just listening to my mom. Because my mom, she never lost herself, despite a lot of adversity. She knew who she was, her value system, even though at times I was worried that it was overwhelming to her. Yeah. But she never did. And she invested so heavily in her children, her patients. Um, She always put people, other people first, but without losing herself. And I think that's one lesson that what kindness is, and I want to make sure the young people listening really, really, they know this, but then you kind of forget it because people talk you out of it. When you're generous to other people, whether you're in any form, teaching or just being a good friend or being a caregiver, and you get more from it than <laughs> you receive a lot of benefit for, from being generous. Yeah. Right? Both from a spiritual perspective an emotional perspective but also from like a career perspective you you don't always have to win every transaction right it's giving 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 um you may not seem like it you are getting 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 too and so um you're really creating a social asset by doing that so like just all the kids out there you know what it feels like when someone's incredibly kind to you a great teacher you're great coach, your parent or favorite aunt, that feeling, the person giving you that feeling is a real leader. Yeah. I mean, what it sounds like, it, it, it definitely ties into kind of the, the theme of this, of, of kindness and math, at least what, what I just heard you articulate. Am I accurate in, in that assessment? Yeah. It's always that order. So kindness and math, right? So kindness in terms of uh, humanity. And math, it does have to make mathematical sense. So after all of these years of managing distressed money, growth money, running a company, blah, 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 going to law school, I could only come up with that formula that made sense to me at 50 something years old. I want everything I do, how I do it, what I do, it has to check both boxes. It has to be kind, like generally positive for humanity, 
or for someone's humanity, and it has to make mathematical sense. The, the math has to work yeah. in that order, right? Kind yeah. math. And I think that for those of you embarking on your, um, your adulthood life, you'll find that the key to sort of joy and thriving and is how do you balance those two things broadly speaking, right? It's sort of whether it's kindness and math or it's your joy, happiness and making a decent enough wage to feel comfortable and feed your family and have some security. It's music and physics, right? It's the irrational and the tautological mathematical statement. It's how do you get both to make sense at the same time? I mean, that is a topic of most great literature from the ancient Greeks to the philosophers, philosophers of Asia, like that's the lifelong quest, right? How do you have both? Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. So just a few more questions. You, you talked about creating that kind of space or gap, if you will, and, and just curious to know kind of what do you do to have fun? What are some of your hobbies? Um, how do you kind of break away from the, the, you know, business routine, if you will. Uh, how do you create that separation in space? Yeah, you know, the 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 ha ha thing I'll say is, what hobbies after raising three children? And like, excuse me, you mean there's time for <laughs> there's time for me? No, that's not that's not a constructive answer. But like, I've invested a lot in my family, and so um, yeah, I think the first thing, the easy answer for me to say to you is this: is that I love music. Music is, continues to be my space. That uh, whether it's playing it, listening to it, singing it, doesn't matter. Like it's, uh, I get into a space and I block out a lot of things that makes me think. Um, and I play tennis. I still love sports, but uh, as I've gotten older, it's getting <laughs> like the body's not functioning as fast as it was. But I think the more important that important way I'd answer this is this. I don't divide work and life. Almost everything I do in my life is because I want to do it. Hmm. I love what I do for my profession. I love what I do in my personal life. And you know this about me, like my profession, it's like, I would do it if they paid me nothing to do it. Like, I love it. Yeah. And so um, I've really tried to find things that I'm passionate about. And I know what makes me passionate. And I think most people actually is that it's when you, there's a, you see positive change and that you feel like you have some impact on someone. Yeah. Right. That's where the greatest joy comes from when you feel like you've done something that improves the situation of someone. Yep. You know, and so that's how I would answer. And like, I think when you have that mindset, um, I think the other thing that I recommend for all the young people, you really want to like have freedom. Does that make sense? You don't have to be an entrepreneur. That doesn't mean like start your own business to have freedom, because as many of you will find out when you start your own business, you have like less freedom. <laughs> it's actually really hard um, and it's constant, but it's not that type of freedom. It's more of a freedom that is that you are running your own race, that you're defining what is successful for you. Hmm. And ideally, when you're running that race in that way, in a really happy way, what happens is that other people want to run with you. So ironically, freedom comes from like independence of measurement of other people, but freedom really also comes with the camaraderie that is built from that mindset. There's your little oxymoron. So I would recommend that. Like that's how I live, try to live my life as best as I can is to be free and to try to live, to, to walk the walk that I think I'm supposed to walk. 
and um, surround myself with great people who are willing to sort of hand me a cup of water when I'm thirsty when I, and they walk with me. No, definitely. Um, I think this, this is a question that I think could be framed for young students, but maybe for everyone. Um, how do you maintain empathy in spaces that value profit over people? Yeah, I would answer this and, you know, my increasingly people are not distinguishing between the two. I would answer that and say, I think that the most empathetic leaders, people, brands are making more profit. It's not despite. And so um, to make some tangible you know, I, I'm not, this is not a paid advertisement for other brands, but I think many of you who are listening, you probably like Apple, right? You probably think it's pretty cool, like the device and the community and the apps. Um, you probably also like Pixar. Hmm. And most of you may not know that, and, or you do, that both companies were, um, founded and have the soul of a person named Steve Jobs. Now, as the biographers will say, Mr. Jobs sometimes could was very um, may not have been have been the um, softest manager, there were some <laughs> bristles to his personality, but he was obsessed with empathy of his customers. Right? It was what's the user experience of a phone, the emotional connection with Toy Story. Hmm. I would argue that empathy is Apple's biggest advantage and why, and Pixar. And it was all amplified by really adroit technology, right? But it was listening to what people needed. That is what empathy is. So I would say empathy is critical to being successful in the business world. Wonderful. Well, James, thank you so much. Um, we, we've got, I've got a couple extra credit questions, but um, at this time, I, I do want to open it up and um, any, anyone from our audience, please uh, submit your questions and I'll get to as many as time allows. Um, but, but I encourage you all to kind of start feeding in some questions and would love to kind of hear uh, James's response. So, got three three questions or so for you, James. What what never what never fails to make you smile? <laughs> oh man, <laughs> like slapstick comedy. Will Ferrell, <laughs> he makes me laugh all the time. Um, yeah, that's an awesome question. Like Will Ferrell. <laughs> Like, I just think he's ridiculous. I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, I think he's just, it's just, I really like oxymorons. Like, I like just things that are, what? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. I love when people say, that doesn't make any sense. I laugh because then I say, it makes all the sense in the world. That means <laughs> it makes sense. I generally think, generally speak, when you laugh, and I think it's, it's neurological too. Laughter is always a great indicator of truth. Hmm. Huh. Right, most great humorists are really revealing truth that people don't feel comfortable saying. Oh, I appreciate that. So truth um, makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Worst piece of advice you've ever received? Oh, I got one. I was uh, 24. And so I know like, and listen up young people, okay? Like I was 24 years old. I was at Harvard Law School. I was um, pretty sure I didn't wanna practice law. Like I wanted to go to law school because of a lot of the knowledge and issue spotting. And it's, it's, a, it's a way of thinking, right? That, and I was uh, interested in going into private equity and finance. I didn't grow up with any money. I wanted to learn how to use it and make it. and. And so I was in an, an HR office of an outfit out in San Francisco, and she said, you have to be a lawyer now because you went to law school. You are a lawyer. 
And I looked at her and I said, what? Like, really? And so just know that like the way a lot of people unfortunately are, they want to put you in a box. And so all of you listening, do not be put, do not get put in a box. Like these like squares and rectangles, other than I think like salt cubes, they don't exist in nature. <laughs> right? Squares and rectangles are the way that humans design. Right? Look at your laptop, look at look at plots of land. The more natural shapes in nature, right? They're spheres. Hmm. Spherical, helixes, circles. There are no boxes. You know, you have insects that live in water and breathe on land. I mean, it's just, that's the way nature is. And so I think we are part of nature. We're a species on this earth, right? So please try to surround yourself with people and live a life of like spheres and helixes and circles. Try not to live a life in a box. That's yeah. my advice. Last question, and we've got some real good ones coming in from the audience. Um, movie about your life. I've got to be in it. Denzel's going to play me. Who plays you? Oh. You better be more fit than I am. Um, yeah, so every, like, um, I think that it's going to be, I don't know. You know that I met Henry Golding out at the Oscars, like, four years ago and mm -hmm. he's pretty pretty you know he may be too too handsome actually <laughs> like i think that i was like oh, i think um but you know i was i had a long conversation with an actor named stephen yoon who played um the farmer in minari minari you know that okay. Oscar. he was also the um korean guy in walking dead i think he's i think i could see him doing a pretty good job and um I don't know. Like, you're Denzel, you think? <laughs> like, I, I don't know. Like, yeah, but we could, yeah, we could do that. Um, sure. All right. Why not? Well, thank you, James. Here are a couple questions here. Uh, what instruments do you play and how does that help you? From a, from a I believe, a student. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I grew up with Korean parents. So um, not that it makes it so, but there was probably a high probability I was going to play a string instrument growing up. So I played I played violin um, pretty seriously up until college. I taught myself how to play guitar. Mm. It's a little bit uh, less rigorous because it has the frets. You can be a little bit more loose with it. And I sing, and I can play piano like somewhat by ear, and so. You know, music is, um, there's a lot of science behind and studies. I wish I had taken a real music theory class. That's a big regret I have. Okay. But music is, it's waves, like physics, right? It's, that's, it's the decibels. It's, it's waves that hit your ears and your ears respond to the, to the waves and it goes into your, permeates your brain, right? So wave theory, music theory, decibels, that's all science. And so I've spent a fair bit of time the last few years really trying to decipher what like key I am. And as best as I can tell, I believe that I'm an E flat major. And so I believe that, um, and I think I'm a cello in terms of a like timber of like what the sound sounds like. Okay. So I spent a lot of time with leaders and with students and with brands trying to figure out what the music key is and what the instrument is, what the, what the natural sound is. And to put that in a metaphor, many of you, um, you'll experiment with different voices and different keys your whole life and trying to fit in. It's very natural. But I think the earlier you can get to a place where you sound like you sound in your room with your best friend, hmm. that you can just be, that's a really good sound. It's a really good key. And, um, and people will like when they hear it because they'll know it's really real. 
So try to get to that place sooner rather than later. And again, surround yourself with people that really like the way you sound naturally. And you'll, you'll be much more successful and happy that way. Well, thank you. How, how would you uh, suggest kind of how to deal with a child that gets kind of distracted? How do, how do you deal with distractions? It was like a question my mom may have sent in. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a lot of distractions today, don't we? Like as adults, we have a lot of distractions and I am really, I, I'm sorry if there are people on this call who are really lovers of social media or founders of companies that I don't really love social media. I, 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 I don't think it's good for us. So in the re household, there's a lot more emphasis on long form content, reading books, paper books, not Kindle books, music. It's a lot of um, analog, <laughs> like analog learning, analog interaction. And so we try to limit digital content without being feeling like we're living in a cave, yeah. right? Like you have to have digital content. That's, that's sure. a lot of very good things about digital content, but a lot of the learning and the way we try to communicate as a family and uh, the way I try to lead companies too, is um, it's kind of a balance between digital and analog. Um, I also, if you probably hear in my voice, I study a lot of philosophy and like theology and and so I spent a lot of time thinking about um, like breathing and yeah. just mindfulness gets overused that term, but really just thinking. And I think that one of the things I can give you advice to use the helicopter analogy, I think in our society today, and um, you know, like it's really tough being a kid because there's a lot of pressure being a kid. And I wanna talk about, I don't think we've talked enough about that. Like I, I see it in my kids and there's so much pressure of being a kid, this constant stimuli. And so um, there's sometimes often a real pressure to make the kids move all the time. Do yeah. this, do that, do this, do that, do this, do that. No, like, I think there's a real benefit sometimes to just staying still. And I think that um, to use a helicopter analogy, like it's to just hover and to, um, to not do this all the time. It's just sometimes you just, and that takes a lot of energy to actually stay still. It's really hard to do that in a helicopter to hover. Yeah. It looks like you're not doing anything, but you actually are really thinking and being very deliberate in your, in your actions versus being all over the place. Yeah. I've got a really good one from, I'm sure from a parent, how do I guide my, my young child to be super kind and continue to be super kind, uh, but to not get taken advantage of. So kindness, I'm glad that, that, thank you for asking that. So kindness, I think kindness is one of these things that the definition has become distorted. Hmm. So when most people think of kindness now, they think immediately niceness. And they immediately then go to YouTube and they say random acts of kindness. And they watch like videos like this and they cry because, oh, it's so nice. That kid uh, gave the kid who lost his ice cream cone, gave him another ice cream cone. That's not kindness. That's being nice. It's like being considerate. Yeah. Um, kindness is very different. Kindness is much more uh, um, steeped in you. Would, most of the major religions are based on kindness. Kindness is very purposeful. It's not random. It's not nice. Kindness is relentless. And it's, um, you are holding people accountable to their best self to their like the best, like human version, that's my dog, human version of themselves. And so kindness is very strong. And kindness doesn't suffer fools. And kindness is very direct. Mm -hmm. uh, when you think about the most kind person in your life, whether it's a parent or a coach or a 
teacher, um, that person usually elicits from you a feeling of like, oh, I don't want to disappoint that person. I wasn't my best self. That leader is kind because the expectations are very high about being your best version of yourself, not myself, yourself. And so that's, that's a social compact. And so um, I don't think that in my leadership style, like I do think that I am a natural teacher, like it's sort of in me, like, or a doctor, that's sort of what's in my blood. But um, I think that if you ask most people on Wall Street or in, I'm not a pushover, it's, there's a high standard of the manner in which you behave. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Not another question. Um, in an ever-changing world, how do you manage academics, social life, and also remain consistent with your learning? That balance. Yeah, awesome. you know, it's, uh, you know, I'm in at MIT, like I help teach in their, this, they have a really cool cloud assist systems orgs. So like my brain kind of works that way. I try to do, it's like calligraphy. Okay. If you can do one stroke, you know, in calligraphy, like you're not you're supposed to do one stroke and not pick up your brush. Um, I try to do all of those things at once. So I learn from, I have a group of friends who I learn from a lot, who make me laugh, by the way, and they're idiots, but they're, and, and, but they're very interesting people, so I learn. And you know the old expression, you are who you are based on the top five people you spend time with, yep. right? So, so I think about that a lot. And then um, they're doing interesting things professionally. I do a lot of business with my friends. And so I think I just answer those three things, right? It's, a, it's sort of like, it's, it's fun. Um, I try, again, try not to live my life in boxes like work James, fun James. I think fun James, work James is kind of fun. Like, you know, I think home James is kind of like um, diligent. I, I don't know. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, it's, again, it's, it's, I try not to compartmentalize. I, I, I think that our brains try to do that to us. That's not a natural way. I don't think that's a natural way to be. Let me, let me close with this question. Um, oh, well, here's a good one. Pink Floyd or YouTube? Or YouTube, not YouTube, YouTube. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's tough. Like, whoever's asking that question knows that I was born in 71, so they know it's a cuspy question. They're like, Floyd in the 70s or U2 in the 80s? That's a, that's a good question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to outsmart this person and say both <laughs> and... Depends on the mood, but I do I do love you too. Um, uh, their their track on Van Diemen's Land, um, it's one of my favorite tracks. So I've got a yeah you know, one question. It's it's a ringer question, but it's it's just kind of really you know, how has CTY impacted your daughter, your family? Just you know. Mm -hmm. You made the decision to to invest in, oh. and your daughter made the decision to test and qualify and go through that process. But, you know, what does it mean to you? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm actually going to do it in reverse order. We first met. I knew of CTY when it was first founded. Uh, I think I probably was 10, 12 years old at the time. And, and I knew of the Hopkins program and had a lot of uh, it was it was a pioneer. And then we met and I did something with CTY before I knew Lila was going to go to CTY. Lila's interest in CTY was piqued by my relationship with CTY as not as a parent, but you all asked me to do something for last year's cohort. Mm -hmm. And I was grateful and I was also impressed that an institution like yours was trying to 
instill in young people a love of learning, but also a love of humanity, that that is clearly my message, that that is my message. That's, and I was grateful and that it felt like if you felt that way, then it was a place where I was comfortable to send my child, right? And that this was a place that would um, advance her humanity and, and shape her ethics and also realize that she wanted to, you know, I think she took cryptology, like um, that these were not contradictory to be really big spirited and big and big minded that yeah. they were actually connected. So I would answer the question that way, that um, that's why Lila was excited about applying. And uh, I was excited that she was excited about applying. And that um, we felt very fortunate that she was able to, you know, test in a way that enabled her to go. And yeah, and she, it was a, it was a, it was a great experience. And this has been a great experience. No, well, James, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, really appreciate it. Um, want our audience to be on the lookout for your book that's coming out. Uh, it's coming, Red Helicopter. Um, so I think we'll be happy to share. You can sign up on my Red Helicopter website, but it'll be up. I'm writing the book similar to this. It's to the parent, hopeful that you'll read it with your child. It's sort of the way that I did my TED talk. It was uh, meant to be sort of a family, a family discussion. No, we'll, we'll definitely uh, be on the lookout for that. Um, thank you, Dr. Amy Shelton, uh, for joining us and introducing James. Um, and most of all, thank our attendees, our, our guests today, um, for sending your questions and being with us tonight. Um, visit the CTY Facebook events page where all of our upcoming events will be posted. Uh, we're planning more exciting events and hope you can join us again. I actually just got word that uh, our next guest for Bright Now will be Eve Rosenbaum, who is the Assistant General Manager for the Baltimore Orioles and a proud CTY alum. So we're looking at later November to uh, get her in and, and hear her story. Um, in just a moment, we'll provide information about the YouTube page uh, where a recording of this webinar will be posted within the next few days. Uh, thank you. Hope to see you soon and have an awesome night. Take care.